Welcome to my second podcast. I want to introduce the first knighted Jew, Sir Jew Simmel, who's based out in Boston. He is a consultant who is a master of two different disciplines. One is what you call predictive and index, or what I like to think of as protective intelligence, but that's okay. And, <laughs> oh my God, I forgot that. All right, and the second thing is he's a master of EOS, which is a system on how to run your company uh, more efficiently, to put it in simple terms. And the reason that it interests me what Sergio does is because I have a good friend here in LA who is a plastic surgeon, but he actually was trained as an ophthalmological surgeon. So he does things that other plastic surgeons can't do because he was trained on very small nerves and things like that around the eyes. And it just makes him a hyper specialist in a world that values that kind of expertise. So Sergio and I were talking last week. He actually gave me a personality test that's called PI. It's similar to, in concept, to like a disc test that you've heard of. And I think for a lot of people, maybe the results of the test are not big surprises, but when you see what you're all about articulated in a very formalistic manner, it's kind of eye-opening, tells you a lot about yourself. But more importantly than what you learn about yourself is what you learn about the people on your team that go through that exercise and it helps you to be a better manager. So today what I wanted to talk about with Sergio is how business is changing under these COVID times where our team is remote, we don't get to see them live in the same way that we did before, how it's impacting the way we manage our teams, how it's impacting company culture, things like that. But before we get started on the more formal things, let me introduce Sergio, say hi. Hi, uh, Jason, it was, it's a pleasure and an honor to uh, be your guest uh, today and uh, great uh, seeing you again after what, about uh, only a week? Yeah, after tearing me apart a week ago with my PI score. And yes, it's good to see you. <laughs> well, it was not about tearing you apart at all because, as you remember, I told you at the beginning that um, uh, an assessment like this is not about strengths or weaknesses. Correct. So, uh, there are no such things. There are just traits, characteristics, patterns. We all have them. You are wired differently than I am. Your, uh, each one of your employees or, or partners is wired different than the other guy or the other lady. And we have to all understand that uh, those differences uh, in order to work well together, right? Absolutely. And I definitely have more insights into how I'm reacting around people. And I'm just trying to train myself to recognize the traits that you help me understand in other people to see how I can get onto their level. You know, we didn't talk about this, but about 200 years ago, I think, maybe 300 years ago, there was a story of a king and his son. And the son took off all his clothing and got under the table of the dining room table mm. and was like clucking like a chicken, something like that. And the king didn't know what to do with his kid and it's a fable or something like that. And they finally found somebody who figured out he had to get down on the floor with the kid and start clucking like a chicken in order to break through and get to him. So a lot of what, you under, what I come to understand through PI is recognizing, as you say, the different character traits of people and figuring out the channel of communication that you can establish to actually get through to other people in a way that is better for them than what you want so and in addition to that there's one other aspect uh, here jason that has to do with uh, people in the context of business which is uh, you know every single person that's participating in the business doesn't matter what the the position is whether it's the leader or part of the leadership or or anybody else who's participating in the business is occupying if you wish a function in a business and that function requires ideally certain kinds of traits. Some of them are cognitive about you know, what people know. Some of them are actually behavioral, which is what BI does and so forth. So the only important part is the level of matching, if you wish, between somebody's set of patterns and what's required for that person to be successful 
in that particular seat in the in the organization or or, or fulfilling that particular function. That distance is is the key part. So you can take anybody and you can fit them perfectly to a job or not so much. And that's where the whole world of uh, coaching starts, of determining whether there are, the person is the right person in the right seat, as we call it, et cetera. I understand. So we've talked a little bit about PI and Maybe you can break down just for the people that are not familiar with that. What, and maybe they know what DISC is or these other types of tests. Maybe you can just give a short synopsis of what the PI test is about and what it does. Sure. Uh, so um, PI or the predictive index, uh, it's been around actually for a long time, for 55 years or so. Uh, and um, it's in the category of uh, revealing traits or characteristics in what we call the affective part of mind or the uh, behavioral or the personality part of mind. And uh, this is actually assumes a model of the mind that has three parts. There's a cognitive part, which is about what we know how to do. There is the affective part, which is what we desire or want or need to do from a desire perspective, from a motivation perspective. And then there is another third part, which is called actually the cognitive part of mind, which is what, uh, which is about what is it that we are actually end up doing, what our instincts drive us to do. So PI is in the, uh, focuses on the middle part and really reveals uh, traits that we all have along four specific drives that have to do with, for example, uh, how we want to affect or need to affect the world around us, or how we need to connect with people, or how we uh, need to uh, uh, need more familiarity versus variety in our lives or in our work, or how do we actually uh, want to follow or not follow systems and rules. So you take all this stuff and you can actually uh, create a very rich uh, description of uh, who we are at our core and what's interesting, also who we think we need to be like in our current setting, in our current job, let's say. And often as you, <laughs> we discussed in your case, uh, Jason, there are differences, sometimes radical differences between who the person is internally and who the person is, wants to be or thinks, even subconsciously, that they need to be to be successful. And the further apart those two things are, the more te internal tension exists, the more, um, if you wish, uh, effort it takes for that person to operate. And uh, that uh, there are interesting conclusions from that or, or issues to, to be tackled. Like, for example, is that sustainable over time, et cetera? Right, so, the pressure builds up. Because I remember you taught me something valuable, which is not all friction is bad, because try walking on ice without friction. Exactly. And I, I've used that line a couple of times this week, and it really makes a lot of sense. And I think that it's... We learn, I'm taking a sales course, and you learn in selling that the customers always lie. Mm -hmm. And not to make that like an evil thing, it's sometimes they don't want to tell you the truth because they just want to keep things close to the vest. Sometimes they don't know what the truth is because they haven't admitted to themselves what the truth really is. There are a variety of reasons, and in the same way that you say there are strengths and weaknesses, there are traits, and when you recognize that a trait of a customer is to not necessarily tell the truth and you work around that, it makes you a better salesperson. So in the same way, a person who understands how PI works, it makes them a better manager of their staff. What I'd want to know is you said there's three parts of the brain, but I want to know where the stupid part of the brain is that every spouse wants to know why their spouse does those stupid things. Which part of the brain is that? In? <laughs> well, I, I, unfortunately, Jason, uh, I cannot help you. And um, uh, in, a, in, a, in a sense, I almost refuse to help. Because <laughs> I, think, I think when you talk about the friction between who you are and who you want to present yourself to be, 
that defines a lot of challenges in marriage because you're constantly in a state of friction determining is this a fight I want to have to be me or is this a or is this something I'm going to give in on because this is what my wife needs or my husband needs whatever your situation is boyfriend girlfriend marriage or not so that's PI PI is and, and what I understood from the testing that you did a big factor of PI is understanding the the traits behind who you are as a person and who you think you are to other people or who you want to be like and and understanding those. So that's PI. The second thing that you do, your ophthalmological surgeon side of you, if you will, is sure. EOS. Yes. And that's a strictly business thing. Maybe you can talk a little bit and give people just to tear off the cover a little bit about what EOS is all about. So EOS stands for the Entrepreneurial Operating System. And you're, you're going to like that, uh, Jason. I tell people to read it from right to left. Uh, right. <laughs> it's a system for operating entrepreneurial businesses. Right. Uh, and it's essentially a set of tools and processes. So this is not a, a piece of software, let's say. It's a set of tools and processes that people, starting with a leadership team of any business, uh, implement in their practices. And these tools and processes ultimately produce three major outcomes which we call vision, traction, and health. Now, by vision, I mean getting first the leaders of the business 100% on the same page as to where the business is going and precisely how is it going to get there, sort of right. full of alignment. Uh, by traction, I mean getting these leaders, the disciplines, and the accountability mechanisms so they really become masters of execution towards that shared vision. And by health, I mean uh, getting these leaders to operate as a cohesive, healthy leadership team. And this is, by the way, relates to all your analogies uh, from the right. family perspective. Um, as opposed to just being a, a, a team of leaders. And once the leadership team starts functioning that way, then we take the, exactly the same tools and processes and we roll them out to everybody uh, in, inside the organization. It doesn't matter how large or small the organization is. So at the end of the journey, and literally, uh, Jason, I take uh, my clients through a journey and it takes uh, roughly about two years to actually fully implement in a mid-sized company uh, this system you end up with a whole organization where everybody's kind of growing in the same direction and fully aligned. Everybody executes better, is more disciplined uh, with accountability, and everybody <laughs> functions inside healthy, cohesive teams. So that's basically EOS. It's been around for about uh, 12, 13 years, was actually created by a gentleman whose name is Gina Wickman. It's um, described in a set of books, but the primary book, it's called Traction. Yes. I had the privilege and the honor to be personally trained by Gina Wickman way back when. Uh, I've been doing this for about seven plus years now and taken maybe uh, over 60 um, companies through this EOS journey, as we call it, or EOS process, if you, uh, as we call it. And it's really, really exciting to see how much transformation, positive transformation it has, almost instantaneously, by the way. Um, uh, when, start, when it starts getting implemented inside any organization. Because uh, speaking about friction, <coughs> excuse me, speaking about friction, uh, it actually reduces the friction inside an organization. And that's usually a good thing. Because basically, the more friction you have, the slower that organization is. And remember, we are talking about entrepreneurial businesses. Right. And meaning businesses that are poised to grow, uh, not businesses that are, say, lifestyle that, you know, we don't care whether they grow or not as long as they kind of break even. No, no, these are businesses that are poised to grow, and the growth needs to actually be done with uh, at l uh, the least amount of um, energy uh, used for it. And right. energy, when we say energy, we mean money, time, people, resources, etc. Well, it's like the Tai Chi of business because you're, you're yeah, yeah. focusing your energy. Well, you know, there's an interesting, 
situation right now in, in, in the COVID world, which is reflected in a, in a lot of ways in the political environment that we're in, especially with an election coming in the next few months, which is you have, in, in a sense, you're describing a framework for leadership where the people being led know what their role is in the environment that they're in. They know the path that they're being led down. They like the path. They like the scenery along the path. Everything makes sense. That's what a lot of this is about. And the idea being that if people are buying into the, it's, it's almost like you're a diver or a pilot. You plan the dive and then you dive the plan. So here, if a company goes through the EOS exercise, you're helping them create that entire journey, as you call it, all the scenery, the path, the beginning, middle, end, all the stops along the way, and the buy-in translates into success. But I'll tell you what's interesting. So I was having a conversation with a, uh, two friends of mine, mm -hmm. and we were all taking different roles in the political realm. So one of us was a supporter of the president, one of us was an anti-Trump person, and the third one, was kind of in the middle. So he was the bridge. Oh, yeah. And as we're talking, I think I made the joke. I don't remember who made it. One of us made a joke and said, you know, Como should be running for president because mm. he looks so presidential. He makes people feel with his, when he was doing his daily briefings, that everything's under control. And because you hear in the news, a lot of complaints, there's no leadership coming from the top which is a separate issue because you have states' rights and government and federal rights. That's a whole separate thing, which you don't really have anywhere else in the world. But putting that aside, it's an easy claim to make that the leadership from the federal perspective, from the White House, does not look cohesive. It just doesn't appear that way. And yet, when you look at the Como leadership, it appears like he went through EOS. The difference is, is that people will say, well, his results maybe are questionable because a lot of people died or the crime rates are out of control or the no bail law. And it's almost as if you can't win either way. If you're, you, you put an EOS and, and you go through two years and maybe you make the wrong decisions. And I think that that's a, it may be a tension that you have to deal with, which is, I think it's, it's, it's an, it's an item worth discussion. And on the flip side, I still think even though maybe the White House, maybe they're making good decisions, but it doesn't appear that way. And it makes people uncomfortable. And I think what you identify through both PI and through EOS in your unique way is that people want to know, that, not that they want to know, they do better when they do know mm -hmm. where they are in the path and where they are in their own personal journey between who they are and who they think they need to be. Absolutely. And so I think that what you present is a synthesis of two disciplines, which is a personal journey and a corporate journey. And maybe that's what makes you more valuable. Well, it's interesting that you put it that way. And let me uh, add to it. Please. I, I learned a phrase, plus one. Plus, exactly. <laughs> plus one. Uh, you know, there's, there's a simplified model of looking at any business as having three dimensions and there are all three dimensions of course in the classic um, marketing way uh, are named with letter with uh, words that start with a little p so they have three p's of the business so sure. they the product there is the process and there are the people right and fourth one which is the most important one profit the, exactly <laughs> yeah, i didn't even know but i guessed it Got it, of course. Now, so um, what I do is basically a cross between process and people. And one thing that I tell my, uh, actually even my clients or my prospects even, I say, listen, I have to make one important assumption here and um, you have to also validate this assumption. And the assumption is that you, you prospect or you company or you uh, client, you have the right product or service, whatever you want to call it, at the, for the right market at the right time. If you don't, 
then no matter how much process we put, and no matter how developed our people are, it's not going to work. So we have to have all these three, but I cannot deal with all three of them because I actually have to choose whether I'm a consultant or a coach. And I chose to be more of a coach, although occasionally I change my hat sure. and I become a consultant. But so, but I, what I do do, and that's kind of addressing one of the, um, uh, the, the things that you, you mentioned earlier, is that I um, facilitate them coming up with the right kinds of answers to any issues that come along, including product issues. I don't solve their problem because I have an assumption here that's very important, which is at the leadership team level, 99.9% .9 of all the answers are in the room. Now, I have to do it this way in this day and age. Well, because they, need to know the, they have to know the questions to ask. Well, it, well, that's number one. But also the answers are in the room in the sense that, you know, rarely they don't know the answer. What happens is that people are not allowed, the dynamic of the, the team does not allow them to actually be free to contribute to the answer and work together because uh, I'm talking about plus one. Right. You know, teams are, a team of six should be, you know, one plus one plus one plus one plus one plus one equals seven, not six. You know what you're describing? You're describing politics, government, because, for example, I have a daughter who's supposed to go to Israel for a year in a month. And we came up with a phrase called the problem is not the solution. Mm -hmm. And what that means is they know the solution. They know they have to get the kids there. They got to quarantine them for two weeks. They have to make sure in the airport they don't go shopping and go to kosher McDonald's for the first time. Like there are things they have to do to lock them up and keep them in a safe environment so that when they finally go to their schools, they're living in a dorm, it's all going to be safe. They know the solution, but that isn't the problem. The problem is all the layers of government that have to sign off and put their two cents in. And so when you're talking about six people sitting in a room, that's the origin of red tape. I mean, it's everyone is not clear on the solution in a certain way, and they got to all give their feedback and be part of it. And it's, that's where leadership comes in Absolutely. in order to set the dynamic and the parameters to get to that end result. And of course, one, and of right. course, once once the decision is made, however it's made, the next thing, and this is basically, remember the third part of, yeah. of the health, that actually is uh, one of the indicators of a healthy team. Once we make a decision, then everybody uh, stands behind the decision. Correct. Read with it or not is irrelevant. Right now, they are actually there. When we made the decision, uh, we are going this direction. Right now, everybody is actually contributing. Contributing in order for that to happen, you know, there is one important uh, aspect that has to be built in, and it takes. That's why it takes. A yeah, couple you need of a big mustache like Stalin. That's what you need. Yeah, what you <laughs> need is to develop trust. Yeah, of course, because you can't be Stalin. You can't this, sit there with a the gun forcing it down. Well, you say, of course, but have you walked into, you know, a, a leadership team recently? Well, that's and why you have a job. Yes. Yeah, All right, so let's do this. Because the, the, the topic in the larger picture is COVID conversations. Yes. And so, and we've been talking for a while, and it's definitely been a, a sort of deep dive into the merging of PI and EOS. Give me a couple of things that you would talk about if you were giving a, a seminar today that has uh, where your expertise sees value in this COVID world where people are working remotely. What do you see is something that you would advise a leader today that he should be doing or she should be doing in their environment that would get them along the road to EOS, even if they're not applying it? Right. So one thing, so a couple of immediate things come to, to mind. First of all, uh, they ha th th there is no such thing as over communication. They got to communicate 
you know, n times more than they used to, because they people don't have the um, let's say the luxury, let's call it that way, of going to the next office or the next cubicle, the next desk or the next whatever, and chatting with people anymore. Right. So they have to make things explicit. So they have to put in uh, in place structures that allow people to actually over communicate, whatever those structures are. And, you know, there's technology for that. I mean, whether that's Slack or sure. whatever it is, you got to actually, you, you can't assume that this is going to happen. You have to actually implement it in, in the organization. Systems. Systems. Systems, but systems that, that enable and, and facilitate, facilitate communication. So that's number one. Number two is that you have to create pulses, places where you actually gather each team together on a regular basis, let's say a, once a week. And that's where we actually kind of look at where we are. Uh, we get a pulse on the business and we set out, we solve issues and uh, we move forward for the next one week, uh, you know, cycle. We right. put those cycles in place because they don't happen by themselves. And of course, EOS has a beautiful and extremely effective. Uh, and when I say effective, I mean tested millions of times. And, you, and I mean literally millions of times. You mean times. radically effective. Radically effective formula for this. Yes. So number two. Number three is that you got to actually start understanding your people at a deeper level. Right. This is where assessments like PI, conversation, is a, you know, there are uh, tools inside the OS, there are tools from PI. Colby is another platform that I use. Right. Another view of people. You got to actually understand where people are coming from, what's their wiring, and you have to match them well to what you are expecting them to do. So these are just three things that come to mind immediately. Well, I learned this week, I'm gonna plus one you, and I learned plus one from Richard Kay at CEO Space, mm -hmm. who's a, uh, a very smart entrepreneur, or leader of entrepreneurs in a certain way, and CEOs. Right. So the plus one was something I learned from Joe Martin earlier this week. He sits with his employees in small groups of five with his team, and they have two minutes of silence where they write down all the things that went well this week, and then they share it with the group, and then yep. they have another two minutes of silence of all the things that sucked, and they get to gripe. And my dad used to call that good and welfare from his fraternity. So it doesn't come back to bite you, it's just for the good and welfare of the team. And we're gonna test that out in my organization. I think it's a great way to give people a forum that is inviting and, and, and comfortable to improve the greater good, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I'll give you a plus plus one. Oh, good, good, good. So when you do that, there are two questions that you can ask your employees, Jason, that are, uh, by their formulation, they are the best managerial questions in the world. Ready? Yes, wait, I want question. to make a drum roll. Da -da -da -da. Yep. First question is, share with us what's working. Second question, share with us what's not working. Correct. Put it in that in those exact words, as opposed to uh, what's wrong or what's right. Because you know, once you get into the moralistic realm of right, wrong, and so forth, people get all right. wrapped up and so forth. But but if you keep it in the in terms of workability, yeah, some, some things work and some things don't work, and and people respond or answer the questions that way. Right. That removes all this emotional overload and the fear. Oh, if I tell my boss, whose name is Jason, about that, what's he going right. to do me? Maybe he's going to think I'm not doing my job. Maybe I should keep my mouth shut, blah, blah, blah. So all of this stuff gets actually set aside. Sure. And just talking about what's working and what's not working. Fair enough. So how do people reach the first night of Jew online? <laughs> well, uh, first of all, they can go to my LinkedIn uh, uh, page at uh, Sergio Simel. So it's LinkedIn.com slash right. Simel. And uh, secondly, they actually call me at 
731-3132. And thirdly, they can email me at sss at getbusinessmomentum.com. Sounds good. Very much a big thanks for coming on. Absolutely. And uh, hopefully we'll get this thing out there and people will start to embrace the idea of looking internally first, get a sense of themselves and see how they can become better leaders for their teams and then give their teams the ability to look internally and see how they can be better players inside the organization. So this is a lot of fun and uh, we'll talk soon. And thank you, Jason, for having me and actually for uh, just the fun of uh, having this conversation. Yeah, with it's a good uh, recording, uh, non, non, notwithstanding the recording, just a pleasure to talking to you as always.